Welcome to the CBP Spring Virtual Conference. Whipfly is proud to be a CBP partner and presenting sponsor. I'm TJ O'Neill, also known as the Thirsty CPA, and help lead our firm's craft brewery team. We offer a full lineup of solutions, including accounting and tax, digital strategies, business advisory, and strategic planning services. Our firm's been working with breweries, wineries, and distilleries for decades. So whether you're a startup or looking to expand, we just might surprise you with a new perspective to transform your business. You can learn more at whipfly.com. Remember, that's whipfly, W-I-P-F-L-I, not whipfly. I hope you're enjoying the conference. Cheers. Good morning, everyone, from sunny but cold Boulder, Colorado, uh, where I am. I'm visiting for a couple of days for work, uh, normally based in San Diego. I'm Julie Wartell, and I will be leading this panel. Honored to have been asked to speak at CBP, um, my first CBP virtual conference, and brought together a group of distinguished individuals to talk about a book that uh, we all contributed to. So a little bit on my background. Uh, I teach at UC San Diego, which is related to the book I'll get into in a minute. Um, I also do consulting on crime prevention and crime analysis and policing, as well as run a uh, service called PubQuest, where we map breweries around the country which actually led to my teaching at UC San Diego. Um, so I was asked to teach a class about eight years ago. Uh, initially, they said, do you want to teach a class called Beer in the City? I was like, who wouldn't want to teach that class, right? This is in the Department of Urban Studies and Planning. So we made it a little bit more professional and call it Craft Breweries and the Urban Economy. Needless to say, it's a very popular class for undergrads, not limited to urban studies and planning students. So as part of the class, I always have a number of guest speakers from the field, of which several are represented here today. And one that is unable to make it, Vince Vasquez, who is the co-editor of the book. And I need to give a little plug and, and show this is the book that we're going to be talking about, highlighting, etc. Craft Breweries and Cities, Perspectives from the Field. So a couple years ago, Vince asked me what textbook I use for my class. And I just chuckled and said, there's no textbook around social science and breweries or breweries and the economy. And he said, would you want to write one? I said, sure. And of course, we go out for beers. We outline on a you know, piece of paper or maybe a computer and come up with what are the topics that we want to cover in this book and or who are the speakers. So again, some of the people represented here today, um, either based on guest speakers or based on our knowledge of people saying, hey, do you wanna to contribute to this book? So um, we were fortunate, uh, Neil Reed actually connected us to an academic publisher who took it upon themselves to take a chance with a mostly non-academic contributors. So we have several academic contributors, but we wrote a proposal on here's what we are saying. So while it is an academic publisher, our audience, intended audience, were really real world professionals in the planning, economic development, and brewery fields such as yourselves. So each of the panelists here today, as well as some others that I'm gonna give a shout out in a minute, were invited to write a chapter in the book based on their knowledge and experience and that they're good writers. Um, so before we get into it, uh, this morning's conversation will go that each panelist will give a brief introduction of themselves and we'll go around and do that. And then each panelist uh, with my prompts will do the biggest takeaway from their chapter. Following that, we will have a few questions for each panelist, but we hope that this will generate additional discussions amongst the panelists and hoping you all in the audience will also put some questions in the chat. So before we get started again, the people that are unable to be a part of this panel but contributed to the book, uh, Bart Watson wrote Craft Brewery uh, Geography and Demography Trends. So many of you are familiar with Bart. He's the chief economist for the National Brewers Association. Um, Vince Vasquez also wrote The Regional Impact of Craft Breweries, Local Workforce Development and Economic Growth. No, I don't have all of these chapters memorized. Um, 
Anna Domorodska uh, from Poland wrote Craft Breweries and Gentrification. She's an urban sociologist who uh, does research on breweries as well. And then uh, Joseph Leroy, Craft Breweries and Sustainability, Civic Solutions Through Leadership and Innovation. Russ Gibbon wrote Municipal Regulatory Reform for Beer Industry Growth, The City's Experience. And the last one not present is Kevin Hamm, who wrote about the experience of the city of Vista, craft breweries cultivating industry growth from within municipal government. So uh, here we go. And one more shout out. Um, as I said, I'm in Boulder. If anyone is in Boulder and wants to meet up for a beer tonight, that'd be great. And then I'll be in Chicago uh, leaving tomorrow. And then Thursday, we're actually doing a little book get together panel at uh, Haymarket Brewery, Haymarket mm -hmm. Pub. So hope to see you there if you're in the Chicago area. With that, um, Neil, you're next on my screen. Can you please go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah, so my name is Neil Reed. I'm a faculty member at the University of Toledo here in uh, Northwest Ohio. Not as sunny as San Diego, but still uh, this is where I'm based. And uh, I've been studying the craft beer industry for about 10 years now. And most of that research has been focused on how craft, why craft breweries go into particular neighborhoods and what kind of impact do they have on those neighborhoods? Thank you. Gail Williams and Steve Shapiro. Hi, um, we are journalists, not uh, academic researchers. So working on this was a, a really wonderful initiation into what social science has been doing in the field of craft beer and in social sciences. There's been a tremendous amount of interest. We have a website called Beer by BART, which started our beer writing in the Bay Area. BART is our regional transit system, and we started out with local tourism as our main focus. That pretty much says it all. I don't that. <laughs> and we made them share a screen. This there morning. we go. Yeah. <laughs> Josh. Hi, all. I'm Josh Newton. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Homelessness Hub at the University of California, San Diego. As you might suspect, I typically do research on housing precarity and housing instability and different types of uh, solutions in community development. Um, but I do do some research on uh, breweries on the side. Dustin. <clears throat> Excuse me. My name is Dustin Hauk. I'm an architect. Uh, we specialize in brewery projects, distilleries, wineries, pretty much anything craft beverage related. related. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, we do work all over the country, so we deal with a lot of different municipalities, um, understanding kind of how to work with the planning and zoning departments and building departments and different codes. Um, so that's that's what we do. We help people get their uh, their permits for building out their their facilities. Thanks, Dustin. And last but definitely not least, Omar. Good good uh, good morning. Um, thanks thanks for having me, Julie. Uh, my name is Omar Passons, and uh, yeah, I am a a city government administrator, but honestly, I think uh, my sort of passion, I think I was thinking back to uh, my first uh, Sierra Nevada Pale many, many, many years ago. And in reality, I think the thing that brings me to this space is is a love of, of community and, and frankly, uh, having sort of been um, reborn into, into craft beer in my 30s and, and, and early 40s, I spent a lot of time just evangelizing for what you all in the brewing community, frankly, do. Um, so I'm, I'm excited to be here in the chat a little bit. And uh, yeah, the, the connections, uh, Josh and Omar, I guess, need to fit more in. Um, I met Omar when he was on a panel talking about breweries in North Park uh, neighborhood in San Diego and how the influx of breweries and craft beer um, have positively affected North Park. And then Josh was supposed to be my teaching assistant in my class. Uh, we got together and met and it didn't work out then. He decided to go get his PhD and coincidentally came back and we now do research on homelessness together, um, but uh, had a great opportunity that he could take on the chapter around Stone. Um, so with that, Neil, what is the biggest takeaway for this audience from your chapter, Craft Breweries as Neighborhood Assets, Adaptive Reuse, Neighborhood Revitalization, and Third Places? Yeah, so as I said, I've been studying this industry for, for 10 years now, kind of focused on craft breweries, why they move into neighborhoods, 
and what impact do they have on those neighborhoods? And I've come to the conclusion after 10 years of research, and we can certainly debate this, but I'll make the statement that craft breweries are assets uh, to neighborhoods. And that's not just based on my own personal research, but also the research of other academics and other folks who have kind of looked at craft breweries going into neighborhoods. And my chapter kind of focuses on kind of three themes, uh, kind of craft breweries and adaptive reuse, this idea that craft breweries will go into old abandoned buildings and turn them into a useful space. Uh, so it's not uncommon to see a craft brewery in an old church, an old fire station, an old automobile dealership. And we're not too sure how common this is in the United States, but we do have some data from Canada that say that about somewhere between 78 and 83% of craft breweries are in buildings which were formerly used for something else. So four out of five, and there's nothing to suggest that that kind of ratio is, is different here in the United States. So this idea of going into old buildings, and I think what this gives the, gives the consumer is this opportunity to drink unique beer in unique spaces. Uh, the second part of this is the impact of craft brews on neighborhoods and the idea that they could kind of move into distressed neighborhoods, uh, occupying or uh, these abandoned buildings. Again, what Many craft breweries are after when they start out is inexpensive real estate. And the cheapest real estate is an old abandoned building in a distressed neighborhood. Now we can discuss gentrification and whether that's happening, whether it's good or bad, how, what we can do about it. But there's no question that craft breweries have kind of contributed uh, to neighborhood revitalization. And in some cases, they've actually been the catalyst for this. Uh, in my home state of Ohio in, in Cleveland, which is a couple of hours uh, east of me, uh, there's a neighborhood called Ohio City, and Great Lakes Brewing Company went in there over 30 years ago, and they were the pioneer investor in that neighborhood and basically kicked off the revitalization of the neighborhood. And then the third piece of my chapter looks at craft brews as third places, which are these kind of neighborhood gathering spots where folks can come together, the community can come together, share a beer, have a conversation, and just enjoy themselves. So those are really the kind of three main thrusts of my, my chapter. And again, the overall conclusion, I, I would argue that craft breweries are in fact assets for, for neighborhoods. Thank you. Before we move on, I'm going to just ask Dustin, uh, in your experience on designing breweries, what percent would you say have been adaptive reuse? Um, <clears throat> as far as the ones that we worked on, it's been quite a bit. Uh, we do a lot of uh, retrofitting buildings that were for a different use originally and trying to modify them to, to be workable for a brewery <clears throat> and that can be as something as you know as as uh reusable as a um an old um maybe it's a, a, a hardware store or um we've done you know different types of buildings and trying to reuse them and, and adapt them for a way for a brewery and it sometimes makes a quite a, a unique environment for the brewery and the patrons as well Thanks. And I guess while you have the floor, what's the biggest takeaway from your chapter, designing and building a brewery, zoning and planning laws and restrictions? Oh, I think it's really important to understand your municipality's regulations and try to work with them, not against them. Um, keep an open mind because um, they may or may not be experienced with small breweries and what they mean exactly. Um, they may have a preconceived notion about what a brewery means on a large scale, but doesn't really know what a small brewery means. And then it's really more of a gathering place and, um, and, and really can be a, a, a social meeting place for the community. Um, <clears throat> and work with someone that knows um, what a craft area is and that they can and that they can help explain that to the building officials so they can have that discussion uh, with the planners on your behalf to help you get approval. Great. Thank you. Uh, Josh, what's the biggest takeaway from this audience or for this audience from your chapter, Building Stone Brewing? Yeah, I think my chapter is kind of a real world example of kind of the intersection of Neil's chapter and Dustin's chapter after hearing what they said. Um, so my chapter looks at Stone Brewing and looks at uh, four of their locations, the one in Escondido, the one in Liberty Station, the one in Berlin and the one in Richmond, Virginia. I think the big takeaway is that uh, in establishing breweries, you have to be able to think outside of the box, think innovatively, um, but you also have to learn to work within the box of bureaucracy. Um, and Stone had to do that with multiple types of bureaucracy. So um, in uh, Escondido, 
uh, well, really in North County, they had to deal with planning commissions and city councils. Uh, in Liberty Station, they had to deal with state and federal uh, historic preservation regulators. Um, in Berlin, dealing with regulators from another country. Um, and then in Richmond, dealing with a large group of economic development stakeholders. Um, and even in Richmond, I think dealing with uh, the kind of context of the neighborhood where uh, you had this neighborhood that had been dealing with urban renewal and uh, kind of uh, municipal neglect for multiple decades. Um, and so I think really kind of balancing that, trying to be creative. Um, one way they did that was using adaptive reuse a lot of times, like Neil said, um, but also working within the bounds of what uh, bureaucracy will let you do. Thanks. Uh, Omar, what is the biggest takeaway for your chapter, Race and Equity in Beer, Complexities in Economics and Community? Yeah, you know, it's I was listening to the uh, to the colleagues on the panel talk, and it's an interesting conversation. I think sometimes conversations about race, about equity, around uh, about racism, these things can just they can be kind of downers, and they can 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 really take the air out of a room. Um, but but it's also one of those things that that I think uh, brewery owners, brewers themselves, um, their staff, their I have lots and lots of friends in the community, in the brewing community, who are um, sort of committed and aware uh, about the opportunities to connect to a broader audience. And I would say, if you're thinking about takeaways, the, the, the first point is this, in, in my view. Right? All of my friends who own breweries understand community. They come from a community. Sometimes it's the, the Marines. Sometimes it's Home brewers, sometimes it's you know investment bankers, a lot of different. They come from from some community. They have become part of a brewing community, and when they open, uh, they are often not always, but often becoming part of a community, and that means something. And so when Neil was talking about how breweries um, are, are assets, I think the the one modifier that, that I would add there is that they they can be the, the degree of which to which they can be an asset is really sometimes predicated on how engaged they're open to being with the communities that they go into, especially when you're talking about some of the more um, you know, sort of challenged communities where legacies of historic racism. Again, nobody's fault on this panel, nobody's fault in the audience that these types of things have, been, have existed in our country, but there's this great opportunity. So I would say one takeaway is brewers and brewery owners understand community and they can help create community. Um, and, and then I, I would just say, Maybe the the second point um, on the issue of race, there is there are some incredible uh, large groups of, uh, we'll say, um, identity uh, related uh, co collections of people. Like Brothers and Craft Beer is a national sort of online group of folks who came together around beer, who travel for beer, who are excited and enthusiastic about what brewers are doing. There are several brewery owners. I, I guess I would say. To the, especially to the brewers and, and prospective brewers and, and that are watching this, there's also, frankly, just the plain truth that, that there's money in diversity. There is a financial benefit to uh, having a space where all of your potential audiences feel comfortable. So those are, I think, the key things I was trying to communicate. Thanks so much. And uh, welcome back, Gail and Steve. Um, so your chapter, Beer Cities and Ale Trails, Patterns and Practices in Craft Beer Tourism. What are the biggest takeaways? Well, uh, we, were, we were just talking about this uh, this morning, and, I, and I, I go back to when we first started to work on this, I think the thing that, that just astonished me was getting, getting a window into the world of academic research and with your help reading a lot of the papers that only people with credentials get to read and suddenly realizing how much work has been done on this, how many people have, uh, you know, how many grad students have started to get data and really look at tourism and craft beer, not just in the US, but around the world. Just really interesting. Some of them are very simple papers and, um, you know, so you, a little bit repetitive as, as you read through them, but the, the vast so the scope of them was astonishing to me. And I think in terms of practical takeaways, uh, really a lot of what reading that, that body of of literature and also the interviews that we did with people, um, it comes back to this idea of making 
alliances. And I think it's a little bit different than building community, but what we saw again and again is that uh, the, you, you would get breweries who would decide to make an alliance and, and define themselves as, a, as an ale trail. Or you would get people who said, let's partner with the artist and cheesemaker down the street. Or in the case of a brewery in Valdez, Alaska, let's um, let's partner with the with the jet ski people who come in in the winter time. So so that to us was was uh, really interesting and really worldwide. It was it was really, you know, we look at we travel a lot and we center our travel a lot around craft breweries in whatever town we wind up in. And for us, you know, basically it's fun. We like it. We love the community. We love, we love uh, good beer. We love the craftsmanship of making it and, and running a business. And, but we never really looked at it in terms of the importance of breweries in a community and the importance and where they fit and how they interact with um, a city and a community. And reading all of the papers was really enlightening. You know, the, how seriously people look at it from a detached point of view, not sitting with a beer in their hand and saying, God, this is good. That's awesome to hear. Um, and so before we go into the questions, I thought I'd give you the biggest takeaway from my chapter, which was craft breweries and crime. Not all alcohol establishments are created equally. So, yes, it's a, a strange combination, right? I, I used to say I map crime by day and beer by night and never the two together until I started really doing more research. And of course, like everyone on this panel, visit breweries when we travel and locally. Um, and realized that in my crime world, crime prevention world, a lot of bars and alcohol research reality are generating crime problems and breweries are just not. And I started really looking into what is it about it, the, about breweries that they don't have crime problems? And I'll let you read the chapter uh, for more details. Uh, Neil and I also co-authored an article. We looked at breweries and crime um, with our colleague Isabel Nielsen in Portland. And so the short answer is that we did not find that crime did not increase when more breweries uh, were went into the city of Portland over a seven year time period. Um, this chapter also focuses on, well, what are breweries doing, whether they know the term situational crime prevention or not, they're actually practicing crime prevention strategies. And so um, that's it on crime and welcome any questions on that as well. So I'm going to go back to Neil here. Um, so while a lot of the research that you and others have done uh, talk about revitalization, and you mentioned um, that there are concerns that breweries contribute to gentrification, how should new breweries handle this if they are moving into a neighborhood that is already gentrifying or likely to be gentrifying? Well, let me preface my comments, Julie, by saying I'm not an expert on gentrification it's not my field of research what i know about gentrification is what i've read in uh, popular media academic literature etc so i'm by, by no means an expert and you know when a new brewery moves into a neighborhood you know if the gentrification has already begun you know they've already joined the uh, investment train if you will and I, and I think this is just so difficult because anytime you have investment in a neighborhood and a brewery comes in and, and coffee shops come in and restaurants come in. It's it just, you, you can't, it's very difficult to stop these market forces because this is what we're talking about here. And I actually go back to when I was in San Diego in November and you and I went to Border X Brewery in the uh, Barrio Logan neighborhood, uh, a Latinx Hispanic neighborhood. And we had spent some time with David Favela, the, the owner of Border X. And he had another term, which I never heard of before, which was gentification. And la gente means the people in, in Spanish. What David was saying there is, you know, what wasn't happening in his neighborhood, it wasn't gentrification because this was the people who were owning these businesses and were, uh, you know, kind of 
contributing to the revitalization of the neighborhood. But if you look at what was happening in, in, in Barrio Logan, even though it was local investors, local folks, real estate prices still go up, right? And, and folks still get pushed out. Now, whether that's better that it's locals making those investments or outsiders, you know, we can debate that. But I think for a brewery kind of coming into a neighborhood, uh, you know, some of the things that Omar mentioned, you know, being part of the neighborhood and not just being an outsider, but I think understanding the demographics of the neighborhood, uh, you know, many breweries are trying to be welcoming third places. So I don't think they can stop the, the process of gentrification. That's much bigger than them. That's up to the city. That's up to the city planners, uh, et cetera. But I think the best that breweries can do is recognize that, you know, this process is going on and just try to be as good neighborhood partners, uh, neighborhood citizens as they possibly can be. In other words, be a welcoming place, uh, be a place which is an asset to the neighborhood rather than just coming in and, and thinking, you know, we're here and, you know, we're just here to kind of get your money and we're just here to kind of, uh, you know, kind of utilize the neighborhood for our benefit. So I think this all comes down to this idea of, of being part of the neighborhood and being, you know, within the neighborhood and being this kind of good neighborhood partner. Julie, can, can I just chime in and, and just say on, on that point, I think one of the things that I have seen some people do really well, uh, Ale Smith, uh, North Park Brewing Company, just to name a couple that are North Park Beer Company that come to mind offhand, is looking in a neighborhood where they are for talent. Uh, these are uh, often even the starting job of a brewery, which is not which is hard work and it's not great pay. But the opportunity for advancement, if you stick around, is there. I just want to say, I think one of the things, one of the other ways, additional ways that that breweries going into neighborhoods, especially, um, you know, neighbors that have some challenges is by proactively seeking to employ folks from the neighborhood. That's a great thought. And actually, thank you for jumping in because I was going to go off script and ask you for any other input. So, um, and while you have the floor then, um, in addition to encouraging Omar, more BIPOC people to get involved in craft beer, how do you see non-BIPOC owned and operated breweries working with government and community groups to improve racial diversity in their breweries? Yeah. So uh, for those that aren't familiar with the term, it just stands for black, indigenous and people of color. It's it's uh, uh, I, I would say maybe as a threshold matter for the folks in the, in, that are watching this, um, the, the notion of engaging in issues to promote or engage in diverse voices and diverse audiences is not it's not primarily a political thing. Right. It's not. This is we're, we're not actually even though if you go on social media or you flip on any news station, it feels like, well, people are just doing this for show or this is about some other kind of virtue signaling or what have you. But I think the the, the reality is that whatever your brewery brewery brewery's ownership makeup is, there are real opportunities to um, partner to help sort of smaller uh, breweries that are led by women or people of color to sort of help them understand the brewery business when you're talking about uh, sort of newer partners. Um, one of the things I, I write about a little bit is some of the access to capital challenges that that face uh, people who come from communities where uh, sometimes their their own assets aren't worth as much, right? The housing prices have been depressed, et cetera. So being able even to partner with larger uh, folks, to, to larger brewery partners to help uh, open the doors of access to capital for these types of uh, um, organizations, you know, smaller or, or diverse breweries, I think is, is a value. And I and the, the last thing I would say is the 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 most well respected, the largest players, the 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 longest standing uh, breweries who have earned reputation, equity, and respect. They can tell municipal officials, they can tell bankers, they can tell the the business people. We want you to be more open to how you distribute your capital. They, they have reputational equity that they can choose to use. And so I just think um, uh, it's a tough market. Everybody's trying to grow their business, which is understandable. People don't, you know, not, breweries are not nonprofit organizations, but those are a couple of, I think, key strategic ways that they can be, that there can be a, a good solid partnerships. Thanks. 
going to shift that uh, similarly to Dustin in terms of uh, any advice for the most effective way that breweries can manage difficult local government officials. Well, I think it's, you know, obviously important to be open and honest. Contact your planning and building departments early. Um, you can also reach out to your economic development office as they may be able to assist and pointing the right direction on who to talk to. Their job is to really bring business to the city and encourage that development. So they want to help make it happen. And so they can really kind of open the doors to have those conversations and identify any hurdles early with those planning and zoning departments. So you kind of know what you're getting into before you get, you know, maybe a lease signed or, or get too far down the, the road with it. You know, know those things ahead of time and and understanding those those regulations and work with them to, to solve the any kind of hurdles you might have. Yeah, thanks. You know, as part of my class, um, my students build a brewery as groups, and that's part of their research. They learn from Dustin, um, but then they have to, based on the city or state or country that they've chosen to build their brewery, do that research, reach out to the officials and find out, you know, what those challenges might be, whether they need a conditional use permit or not, all of those things um, just takes, you know, if undergraduate students can do it, breweries, um, find the right undergraduate student to help you, I guess, if you're not uh, familiar with that. Um, and while we're on the advice, I guess, well, let's move to Steve and Gail. Um, you talked about ale trails and similar strategies for clustering breweries for tourism. Do you have any recommendations for how a brewery can bring recognition to a cluster by interacting with government agencies and organizations that promote local tourism? Yeah, this is... Um one of the more important things that you know we've experienced both with our local uh, breweries and in our readings and studies about this is how important it is for a brewery to build relationships both with governmental entities and and sub subsequent entities and also with local businesses and other breweries in the area and then leveraging those relationships to help bring in business to the local area. The example we started with was uh, Russian River Brewing um, in their Pliny the Younger release. Um, that was a phenomenon started in 2005 where they released the first triple IPA um, in, in the country and people flocked to the brewery and it became a thing every year they did this. And then around 2013, um, the Santa Rosa economic, um, economic organization, governmental organization did a study of the impact, the economic impact of this phenomenon of people coming from all over the world to, to try this beer. And that leveraged into an incredible amount of local media. As, as, as you know, newspapers don't write about breweries all that often. Uh, out here, wine has always been the king. Sonoma Valley, Napa Valley, lots of wine writers and newspapers and things like that. Well, this started uh, the local thing, writing about beer, and it became a thing. And they've, did, they've done it every year since, and each year it shows more money is coming into the area because of this brewery. And then looking at the other, the ale trail phenomena is working with either the economic, the DMOs, destination marketing organizations that are common in a number of cities and working with them or just for working with each other to create a cluster of beer venues, whether it's just breweries or breweries and, and pubs that specialize in beer and creating an entity that is a thing where you can talk about um, this being an, a beer city, okay? You look at Grand Rapids and Asheville, North Carolina, when Charlie Papazian did um, uh, his poll about Beer City USA. They won 
they won the titles and they have leveraged this for years. It still goes on where they still use the title in their marketing of Beer City USA, um, which has no official meaning, but it has tremendous publicity uh, value. And they get to leverage uh, marketing through that. There's a lot of breweries, quite frankly, don't have the bandwidth uh, to do their own marketing in that kind of a way. And this kind of leverage is very helpful. And the ale trails, working with each other and understanding and leveraging the, the already cooperative relationships that breweries have with each other, this is a way of, of building their marketing and building themselves as a destination for people uh, coming to the area. Thanks. Uh, speaking of people coming to the area, next question is for Josh. So when Stone first built in Escondido, a suburb of San Diego, for those of you not familiar, um, not only had people not heard of Escondido outside of San Diego, the street actually wasn't even on Google Maps yet. Yet from the day they opened, they were jam-packed. How did they work to get people to come? Yeah, and I, I'll just add to that. There was another risk as well at the beginning, which was that the original site that they wanted to uh, start in was in San Marcos. Uh, and the Escondido spot was double the size of that spot. So I, I think there was even that risk as well. But um, I think the way that they got people to come, other than when I was talking to Greg, Greg Cook, I think he would say people finally understood stone brewing. Um, but I think the way that they got people to come was uh, they didn't wait for people to come. They actually went out to the people. Um, so this was in the form of, uh, I guess, gathering resident support. So for instance, when they were trying to build in uh, San Marcos, they got a lot of pushback from people who thought this would bring drunk driving and noise. Um, and so they actually chose not to um, establish their brewery there because of that. They wanted to actually have resident support from the beginning of the brewery. Um, and they had that in Escondido. But the second thing I think is that they tried to come up with as many ways as possible to root themselves in the locality and in the place of Escondido, um, whether that be uh, in their brewery and restaurant using native plants, um, different types of local materials, um, the use of local art to draw people in, but also um, kind of bigger ways as well. For instance, eventually uh, they purchased a local farm that was struggling and kind of used it as a way to source produce for the restaurant, um, but also used it as a form of, of kind of agricultural education for the community. They also engaged with local nonprofits um, in a number of ways um, and also uh, collaborated with other local breweries and even promoted their beers in their own brewery. And so I think this, this kind of way of not waiting for customers to come to you, but going out and making those connections is what really made Escondido boom. Thanks. Um... Any other thoughts on those issues around whether it's Stone or other breweries from other panelists about attracting um, customers to your brewery? You know, I would say one thing, it's a brewery that is not, uh, doesn't, well, it was bought um, uh, a while back, but um, Modern Times, actually, the, the founder had a really, I think interesting approach that we've seen in other types of businesses. Uh, for those that followed along, you might remember that Jacob had started a, a a blog that was pretty almost intensely authentic in its vulnerability. Like he was like, "Look, this is real hard, and the city's jamming me up this way," or "Man, my supplier just you know you know, bounced, and I'm I'm losing my mind." It's I think uh, there's a there's a there are folks who use the tools available to them in really good ways to build a connection uh, to community so that by the time the brewery opens, people feel invested in what you're doing. And so that's, it's not part of, I'm a former land use attorney. This is not part of that experience, but but just having seen it in a number of ways with former clients and things, I think that's something that's 
that, that's another example of just kind of going to people from a virtual virtual sense. You know, that it's a great point, Omar, because, you know, Kevin talks about in his City of Vista, and I actually met Kevin Ham. He was the director of economic development. He's retired now, but um, there was an economic summit in Vista, um, a brewery economic summit. And he stood up there and said, you know, we have more breweries per capita in Vista than anywhere in the country. And I was like, well, that's not true. But, and that's my introduction to Kevin was saying, you're full of, uh, um, and so then he modified that. And as we got to know each other, he'd say in California, in San Diego County. And so, yes, there are a lot of breweries in Vista, um, but their big thing was they saw the economic and community development value in Vista. And so it's pretty unique that a city government is actually reaching out and saying, we want more breweries and we're going to make it easier on you to move in here. And we're going to build the, you know, the highway 78 in North San Diego County is now the hops highway. Um, and so it was a combination of the breweries, government officials, and uh, the Brewers Guild and others working together to really promote that. Uh, any other thoughts before I go on with my more questions? Sure. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I, I think in terms of attracting people to breweries, uh, one interesting thing in watching the relationship to tourism, um, I think that we probably all realize that nobody wants to go to a place that feels like a tourist trap, whether you're the tourist and you're somewhere else or whether it's in your own neighborhood and suddenly it seems to be overwhelmed by people who are only go there once. And so I've watched, I've watched in a few cases, really interesting things. There was a, a, a nice brewery in San Francisco that had a sign up for quite a while that said, please rate us on TripAdvisor. And it was like, Really, it seems like a local place, but they're asking tourists to rate them, and they they finally took that down. And it might have been it might have been useful, but I but in thinking about that, I think that they somewhat shifted to where some of the bartenders would talk to someone if they said, "Yeah, I'm in for the weekend from New York." They'd say, "Oh, you know, why don't you rate us on TripAdvisor rather than having a sign?" So that's just a tiny little tidbit about how this this all works. It's it's a delicate dance of. Uh, of attracting people and trying to not look crass and not to and, and to honor the locals so that you feel like a local place that visitors get to be part of. Right, because I think that's a big thing is a, a lot of what makes craft breweries special is that they're so much a part of the community and of the neighborhood and that local third place as Neil has talked about. And I, and I think uh, Gail's point's a good one there because not only do locals not want to go to a place where there's lots of tourists tourists don't want to go to a place mm -hmm. where there's lots of tourists they want that local they want to use the word authentic experience so i think gail's point is uh, well taken there thanks and and neil well you know economics was not in your chapter specifically i know you've done some recent research around breweries and property values how can breweries can you Tell us a little bit about that research and how breweries can use that information um, as they go to decide to move into a place. Yeah, so as I said, I, I've kind of come to this conclusion that, that breweries have impacts on neighborhoods. And it's one thing to say it, but then it's another thing to actually have some social scientific evidence that backs that up. So with my colleague, Isabel Nielsen, the University of North Carolina in Charlotte, what we did is we ask the question, what impact does the opening of a brewery have on real estate values surrounding that brewery? And so we did a study based at, based in Charlotte, and we were looking at breweries, uh, sorry, homes, uh, homes within uh, half a mile of a craft brewery. And what happened after that craft brewery opened up within half a mile of that property? And the reason we chose that half mile is, let's call that within walking distance of the brewery. And thanks to some fairly uh, kind of sophisticated uh, statistical techniques that Isabel kind of brought to the table, uh, we were able to isolate the impact of a craft brewery on surrounding uh, real estate values. And we looked at single family homes, we looked at co uh, condominiums, and we also looked at commercial properties. 
And what we found is that after a craft brewery opened in a neighborhood, uh, that the, the value of single family homes, this wasn't an immediate impact, the value of a single family home would on average rise by 9.8% as a result of the opening of that brewery. Uh, interestingly, for condominiums, the increase was only 3.2%. And we found that for commercial properties, there was no increase in value or as a result of being within half a mile of that craft brewery. So what's interesting here is the biggest bump went to single family homes, right? And, and we believe that that's because these breweries very often function as these neighborhood third places, right? Where folk can walk on a Saturday afternoon or Friday evening, enjoy a beer, and not just by themselves, but take their take their two-year-old kid and take their dog as well, because many breweries have this kind of dog-friendly, uh, kid-friendly type of uh, philosophy. <laughs> so uh, I we also just replicated that study, or I replicated that study with two colleagues from the University of North Texas, and we looked at Denver, and we found similar results for the city of Denver as well. Uh, so what this tells me and what this should tell breweries is if you're talking to uh, the local zoning board or the local uh, economic development folks, they want to know, well, how are you going to impact our, our neighborhood? Are you going to are you going to bring down property values, right? Because you're this drinking establishment and the work you and I have done, Joey, showed that craft breweries don't increase crime. So you combine that with this research that shows that craft breweries actually contribute to enhance property values, I think craft brews can then go in and say, hey, we've got a pretty good argument here as to why we would be a good uh, good uh, neighborhood partner or a good piece of, you know, of, of this neighborhood. In other words, the, the, we're not a negative impact, we're, we're a positive impact. Right. Steve? Yeah. Uh, piggybacking on that, just this morning when I was uh, you know, getting ready to come on here, I was noodling around the internet and I came upon um, this economic study done in Pittsburgh, and it was done by a real estate company that actually did a study and deemed that Pittsburgh was the number one beer city in the country. And they were using that as their marketing. And they had a thing where the uh, a pint of beer is the cheapest in Pittsburgh of any city in the country and various things. And I thought, how interesting. And it was the second one that I've seen where a real estate company, not a DMO and not an economic organization for the government, had commissioned a study to promote real estate. Yeah, I think it, I don't know if that one was CBRE, but they've done some multiple, some big commercial real estate um, around that. There's, um, you know, banks that focus on we want to do loans for breweries because they see ad advantageous to that. Mm -hmm. um, Dustin, you've probably been to the most planning commission meetings out of all of us here. Do you <laughs> see that um, that property value, real estate value can help the breweries when they're fighting for? <clears throat> Yeah, absolutely. In particular, there are some uh, municipalities that that really see what that opportunity is and means for them. They've seen what what places like Stone had, did for, had done for Escondido, what Russian River had done for um, uh, Sonoma and that, those areas. And so we're seeing some municipalities, you know, reaching out and trying to attract breweries to their towns, um, much like Vista did, and trying to sometimes even partnering with the brewery to help them um, get through that that some some of the financial hurdles of, of opening a brewery because they understand what that economic development means and improvement to a neighborhood or the town or really just creates a draw to that part of town that may not have had it before and and kind of combining that with other development that they're trying to push for for that neighborhood so we certainly see that kind of happening um, pretty much everywhere across the board that's great. And, you know, I've presented at uh, the Craft Brewers Conference in the past on that, like the importance of using research and findings to, you know, push your case. Um, we have a question from the audience uh, for Gail and Steve. Any advice for an existing brewery who doesn't get much support from their local tourism bureau? <laughs> well, I, 
one thing is that I've always seen, and it's, you know, it's been on my soapbox, I've been on the soapbox for years, is to really start developing relationships with your local elected officials. And invite, make, go out of your way to build relationships with them because they're the ones who will generally uh, have a say in funding a local DMO. Um, they will have, you know, a, a tremendous amount of say in, and Dustin would know this about how easy or hard it is to, you know, for zoning and for regulations and for all of that. So uh, th I think that's, that's one very important variable is to really, really get involved in local politics and meet people, meet, meet the uh, elected representatives, invite them in, have a beer with them, show them how cool the place is and what it's doing for the community and how happy its citizens are when they're there. And I, I would add to this, another thing is um, get data. Even, even if nobody's doing a study on you yet, you get all the data you can and, and, and think about surveying people who are in over a weekend and ask them, you know, make up a little thing with a QR code and let them fill out, you know, fill out a little questionnaire and maybe win a hoodie or something like that. Because if you've got some data, even if it's, if it's, you know, not, at the level that you want from a, a major research firm, then you can take that to somebody and say, hey, we found this out. Um, maybe you'd be interested in doing some more study because this obviously has impact on our whole, our whole community. Yeah, that's a really good point. And again, that part of the, you know, facing those challenges is using what research we've heard a little bit about, a lot of the research that can be valuable to help the breweries. Um, but collecting your own research to supplement or complement what others have seen in other places um, can be really helpful. So uh, I have nine, well, 9.52, I guess it's 11.52 on East Coast time. Um, any last comments from any of the panelists or your last opportunity from the audience to throw a question into the comments? I'll just I'll just build on what Steve said. Um, I think that was part of the initial success of Stone in Richmond was that they had done a call for proposals to multiple cities throughout the United States, and you know ended up deciding on Richmond. And so by the time they came to Richmond, they had a, the support of a large group of local politicians, um, the mayor, city council members, neighborhood association members. Um, and even the governor of Virginia. So I, I think that there's something there in terms of, uh, as Steve said, kind of making sure you're embedded in the local politics and shaking hands with those people. Joe, I'd, I'd just like to ask Gail and Steve if they have any thoughts or comments on, on social media and how breweries can or should be using that, with not with respect to the, to the local community, but to attract tourists or to to uh, promote themselves as a, as a tourist destination? Not, we're not really experts uh, in social media or marketing. Uh, and, you know, obviously that's, that's a, there are people who really know that can really finesse this, but uh, we do see, uh, you know, obviously we we're in a, a period of time where everybody's on their phone once during a visit to a brewery, even if they're there with a bunch of people and they don't think they're on their phone. And uh, uh, having a presence is important. I, in terms of outreach to either you're building your local community or building international tourism, I really don't. I really don't know how to. I, I don't know what the strategies would be. But obviously, it's important to be there. It's also important not to get bogged down too much in, um, you know, seeing what seeing how you're perceived and, and worrying about, about criticism, because that's one of the things we know from teenagers on up that that can be really demoralizing. So, you know, go forth, use social media, but don't let it get you down. That's all I could say. The, the other thing I would say, this is takes me back a number of years and it's gotten a lot better, but for all breweries, have your social media addresses prominent in the brewery have it on the menu, have it above the bar, have it everywhere so that if people are sitting there and enjoying the beer, 
boom, they can go right up. They, they don't have There's to search Instagram. around. Mm -hmm. You know, it can just post their picture, post, you know, on whatever, uh, whatever avenue they choose, but just make it easy for people to communicate their own authentic experience that's uh, uh, important. And along those lines, great thoughts, everyone. Um, and Omar had to leave early. I uh, apologize for having to leave. But um, on the diversity issue, and I am on the DEI Marketing and Communications uh, Subcommittee for the Brewers Association, and we just put out uh, a little resource around using social media um, for diversity. And it is. It's authentic. You know, make sure what you're putting out there is around what your real values are and what is really represented by your brewery and you know versus uh, a brewery that i won't name here recently you know in trouble several breweries over the last several years in trouble for what their social media posts have said um, so keep in mind that your social media what you're posting as well as what your customers are posting is going to represent what people see as your brewery. Um, and then the other last comment that I wanted to make um, is, and it was along the lines of kind of what Neil and Josh were saying around the government. I've actually been collecting for several years, just quotes from government officials about wanting to have a brewery in their city because they know it's economic development. So. Any of the research uh, articles, stuff that I've done, created for class, always happy to share with people. So don't hesitate to reach out. I know Neil, that's how I met him, was I, I read an article he wrote and I reached out and uh, we've been friends and drinking buddies ever since. Though we have a difference, he likes pints, I like flights. So <laughs> on that note, um, thank you, Andrew, again, for hosting us and Craft Beer Professionals. And have a great day, everyone. So long. Thank you.